I would like to welcome our distinguished witness for the second panel. As with the first panel, it is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. Uh, if you be kind enough to stand and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer. He, he let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. Um, you may be seated. Let me again thank you so much for being here. The Honorable Herbert Allison is the Assistant Secretary of Financial Stability at the United States Department of the Treasury. He is responsible for developing and overseeing Treasury's policies on financial stability, including the Trouble Asset Relief Program, TARP, under which HAMP was established. Assistant Secretary, again, welcome, and of course, um, uh, your opening statement, of course, uh, will be included in the entire record if, if you have a written statement. But in the meantime, you, you can proceed. And uh, we're not going to put the light on you. We, we are so anxious and eager to hear what you have to say. We're not even going to time you. And that's unusual for this committee. You know, we here in this committee, we have a trap door. And after five minutes, we push the button and the witness disappears. But with you, you take as much time as you like, OK? Thank you very much. You may begin. The chair is only being that brave because you're not a member of Congress. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the progress and impact of Treasury's efforts to prevent avoidable foreclosures. We have implemented a historic program designed to address an unprecedented problem. Ultimately, a groundbreaking program of this scale will have challenges. However, in the year since launching the Home Affordable Modification Program, or HAMP, we are on track toward the original goal of providing trial modifications for up to 3 to 4 million homeowners by 2012. By the end of last month, over 1 million homeowners were benefiting from substantial reductions in their mortgage payments. More than 170,000 homeowners now have permanent modifications, and an additional 91,000 have been offered permanent modifications subject only to their signatures. Homeowners and permanent modifications are typically saving $500 a month. HAMP helps homeowners facing financial hardship. Nearly 60% of homeowners in permanent modifications have experienced a reduction in income, such as lower wages, or unemployment of a spouse. We understand the stress caused by possibly losing one's home, so we work to make the modification process quicker and more efficient. For example, we'll soon have homeowners provide a simple, standard set of documents before entering into a trial period. This way, homeowners should spend less time exchanging documents with their servicers and waiting for a decision on a permanent modification. We have also announced new protections for homeowners facing foreclosure. From now on, servicers may not refer to foreclosure any homeowner who is potentially eligible for HAMP until the homeowner has been evaluated for the program. Servicers will be required to pre-screen every homeowner who has missed two or more payments to determine eligibility for HAMP. If the person is eligible, the servicer must inform the homeowner about the program. Homeowners in the foreclosure process must be provided with clear, written explanation of the often simultaneous processes of referral for foreclosure and evaluation for HAMP. The new guidelines will make clear that if a homeowner enters into a fully verified trial plan, all pending foreclosure actions must be stopped. Additionally, Homeowners in bankruptcy can request to be considered for a HAMP modification, and servicers must comply. We believe that these new guidelines will empower homeowners with more information and greater opportunity to receive help before they face foreclosure. Inevitably, some homeowners will not be offered a permanent modification. However, they may still receive assistance in avoiding a foreclosure sale. In April, Treasury will initiate a program that can enable homeowners not receiving a permanent modification to transition to more affordable housing. 
Foreclosure alternatives may include a short sale, a transfer of a deed in lieu, in, in, uh, lieu of foreclosure, or a modification outside of HAMP. This program will provide helpful options for homeowners facing foreclosure. Though these enhancements will improve the experience of homeowners using HAMP, we know that more work needs to be done. We share your goal of helping to stabilize communities by preventing avoidable foreclosures. The administration has been keenly focused on finding ways of expanding eligibility for HAMP and related programs so that some additional homeowners struggling with unemployment and underwater mortgages can qualify for assistance. We and our colleagues in HUD look forward to briefing you on these ideas in the very near future. So with that, thank you, and I'll be glad to take your questions. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Mr. Allison, for your testimony. Let me make certain that um, I have some things clear here. I thought the most interesting part of your testimony was uh, your announcement that yesterday Treasury issued a new directive that in effect requires to give people a chance to have their loans modified before they are foreclosed right. on, as you just said. Right. If that is correct, uh, that is a big change from today where borrowers have to track down the lenders rather than the other way around. Uh, you know, and I listened this morning in terms of, um, uh, I think it was um, Mr. Uh, Dodaro, who indicated that um, uh, there's a problem in terms of a bottleneck in terms of people not being called back, losing papers and all of that. I mean, you see that being changed or being turned around because, you know, this is a life or death situation with people. You know, I, and I guess the reason it's on my mind so much is that a lady who had two jobs, and of course she lost one of her jobs, and the company moved out, rather moved away, and now she has the one job, and she's she just having difficulty paying her mortgage, and she went in for modification, and the things that she was telling them in terms of how she's not able to even get anybody on the line to talk to her about, you know, her modification. You know, uh, will this change or do you need more resources? I mean, what's the problem? Because there is, you know, up to this point there's been some yeah. problems. I'm hoping that this, moving forward, that uh, maybe it would be better for people because uh, I don't know whether you were here at the time, but mm -hmm. we had a bunch of keys yes. that we showed. Right. And those keys represent people who have lost their homes. And um, that barrel is going to get f bigger and fuller. and and this is going to continue um, if we do not have a program that really works. Now, um, uh, I must admit your statement is very, very encouraging. Um, you know, so do you think that we're really going to be able to implement this or here we go again type of thing? Yes. Uh, thank you for that question. I think uh, certainly we've seen a lot of frustration with this program since its inception. Uh, people who are facing the prospect of losing their homes have been anxious. Um, they have been calling servicers. In many cases, they haven't gotten the answers that they needed in a timely fashion. There have been instances of uh, losing documents, for example. I'd like to give you, though, some background on what's been happening, some of the reasons for it, what we've done about it. If you go back to a year ago when this program was designed, um, there was no standard approach to modifying mortgages. And servicers didn't provide service. What servicers did was collect payments every month and then foreclose on people who couldn't pay. What this program has done is to require them, first of all, to do something totally new, which was to deliver modifications that produce real reductions in monthly payments. Until this program was designed, most modifications actually increase payments that people had to make every month. So what this program has been, has been designed to do is increase affordability for many people throughout the country who are under stress right now. So the first change was they had to go back, redesign their processes, redesign their systems, learn how to engage with homeowners in real conversations and conduct tailored modifications of those mortgages for thousands and thousands of people. This they had never had to do before. 
I think for a while they were in a state of denial, frankly, about the challenges that lay ahead. Um, last summer, we called the services together. Uh, we pointed out the importance of, of outreach as rapidly as possible to these millions of people who could benefit from a modification over the next few years. And what we saw was a gradual and then accelerating increase in outreach. In fact, we set a goal for doing 500,000 trial modifications by November 1st. We were able to achieve that goal about a month early. But during the meantime, servicers had to increase capacity. That means they had to hire more people, train those people, and frankly, along the way, there were lapses in training and in capacity. Last fall, as the outreach was ramping up and we were doing more trial modifications, uh, we began to see that conversions to final modifications would represent a challenge. So again, we engaged the servicers and uh, late last fall, we had our people uh, and Fannie Mae's people in the shops of the leading servicers all day, every day, working with them, giving us reports twice a day on the progress in converting trial modifications into permanent. One of the issues with these conversions has been the last summer, because of the huge numbers of people who were desperate for modifications, we allowed modifications to take place on the basis of stated income instead of vi verifiable documents up front. Otherwise, we couldn't reach enough people rapidly because it would take them while, a while to get their documents together. And then the servicers had to reconcile the stated income with the documents that eventually were provided. And what they found in some cases that there were discrepancies between the stated income and the actual documents. So reconciling the, the statements with the actual documents has been a challenge. That's one of the reasons why this has been slow. Another is purely capacity of the servicers. And we've been pushing them very hard to increase capacity and they have been doing so. Now, to take stock of where we are today, we estimate, and we've estimated consistently since last year, there are about 1.8 million homeowners who'd be eligible for this program. We have reached, with offers of modifications, 1.4 million. We have 1 million people in active modifications today, saving many hundreds of dollars a month on average. I think if you talk to those people, those million homeowners, they'd tell you this program has been a success for them. So we've, we already have modifications for most of the people who we think are eligible today. Now the challenge is to convert as many of those modifications as rapidly as possible to final uh, modifications. We uh, estimate that right today, if you take the homeowners who have been in the modification uh, program for at least three months and have made their payments and therefore are eligible for a final modification, about a third of those have either received a final modification and is in place or they have a final modification offer that was sent to them and only requires their signature to be effective. So about a third of the people eligible for a final mod today have one either uh, in place or available if they just sign. We have more to do. We have about another half a million people who uh, are waiting for their modification to be decided upon. And frankly, they've had to wait too long. We've kept this open to allow more time for them to gather their documents and for the servicers to review them. Uh, we expect that that back backlog will be uh, decided by the end of May. And as a result of that, many more people are going to be in final modifications. And we will have essentially uh, removed the backlog. And the servicers then will be able to be much more current in dealing with new applicants. We still have a goal. It has not changed since the beginning of providing opportunities for three to four million homeowners to uh, have trial modifications of their, uh, of their mortgages. And we yep. expect that many of those will be converted to final. Right. My time has long expired, so I now yield to the gentleman from California, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, um, you're saying the goal is three to four million homeowners. Uh, as of February, um, there's a 
207,000 uh, permanent mortgage modifications. That equals about 6% um, of 3 million, right? Um, when we talk about this, your number, th uh, 3 million or 4 million, we talking permanent modifications. Is that, the, is that a goal of 3 or 4 million, or is permanent modifications not the goal, but just to maintain temporary? Yeah. There's, there's a lot of thought or a lot of questions about what the goal is. And the goal at the time it was announced was 3 to 4 million trial modification offers. That's in a report by the GAO that was filed last summer. Okay, let, now, let me I, interrupt. Yes, sir. So just a temporary hold is, is your measurement, not how many we are able to get out of the system and get over to a permanent answer rather than I'm, I'm just worried about a standard yeah. that sounds very yeah. good until you read into the word, listen to the words that are being used that basically temporary um, modification is a goal into itself and thus being in the system is, is a success, not g getting people through the system and back out the other end yeah. for they have a permanent stability. Yeah. I fully understand your question and, and the reason behind it, so let me just explain Go ahead. why. Um, we are trying to reach as many people as possible to make this offer, right? Um, we want to convert as many of those as possible to final modifications. Uh, in or and we estimate right now about 1.8 million people are eligible. We believe that over the four-year period, there'll be three to four million people who are eligible. I think the fair way to look at this is to look at the, if you're looking only at trial, at final modifications, let's look at the percentage of the final modifications to the people who are eligible for a final modification at this point. That's about one third. It's not yet adequate by any means. We're working very hard to make it so. Uh, we also have to recognize, and we did at the outset when this program was designed, that not everybody who gets a trial modification is going to be able to, uh, and, and then receives a final mod, is going to be able to continue. What we have learned in this process, and what was not expected, I think, when we started out, is that uh, the, 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 is the difficulty that many people would have either producing the documents or maintaining their payments. And we've seen people uh, who are unable to produce documents that reconcile. We've also seen people drop out of the program because they uh, are not paying. Let me point out that the taxpayers pay nothing during a trial mod period. The taxpayers only start paying when the mod is final. And that's to protect taxpayers' interests as well. People who cannot continue in this program will have the opportunity for uh, another method of foreclosure avoidance. All of us want to see these people be able to avoid foreclosure. And so we are instituting uh, the short sale program, the deed and loop program, to provide a dignified way for Excuse people me, when who did cannot you, pay uh, the exit. You say you are yes. uh, initiating that. Right. Uh, when, uh, when is that initiation? Next month. Next month. Yes, right. That, that's How right. long have we yeah. been looking? Uh, why, why has that initiation been so slow? Well, because we've had to work with the servicers in developing the program and in designing the program. And uh, so that has been, as you know, this is a voluntary program. We've had to work with the servicers on that as well as on the second lien program. And second liens, as was testified to before, are an extremely important factor in people's ability to stay in their homes. Well, let me just say, as the chairman pointed out quite appropriately, there is a degree of urgency here, and that urgency was not just to those who um, had the right. had the loan problems or those who who um, had given out the loan problems. There was a general urgency in the community across the board, and this seems to have dragged on to a point where that just being in the process was a great success. Now you tell me that we even got the situation where people just need to s put their name on a document. How many right. of those do you, we have hanging out there of just? getting people right. to bother to sign right. a document. Right now we have about 91,000. 91,000. That's right. And we're also reaching out to them to urge them to sign that document and get it back to us. Now there are some things that we cannot control. We can't control entirely 
uh, people's ability to pay. We're trying to make the offer. We're trying to give them every opportunity to put their documents together. Uh, and we that's why we have extended the trial period as we have to give more people a chance to qualify this program is all about reaching out to and enabling as many people as possible hopefully three to four million to get into this program as rapidly as possible well I, I appreciate that but there needs to be a frankness too of just telling people flat off like you would a family member that look your overhead everything we see here just says that you know We'll give you this much hope over here, but be up frank and up front. I think that one of the ways we got into this is people in and out of the government get to giving people false hope, telling them they can bite off more, they can chew, they can carry more than they, they can bear, and then sitting there wondering how we get into this. And I hope that in this program we're not committing the same crime by not being frank and open with somebody that yeah. needs to have hard cold yeah. facts given yeah. to them. Well, uh, and as I mentioned before, we are going to resolve the backlog of undecided trial modifications we expect through the servicers by the end of May. So that time is coming up rapidly and we're pushing very hard for those decisions to be made. Uh, I think we have to keep in mind that this crisis has been going on almost three years. It began in the middle of 2007. For the first 18 months of that, virtually nothing was done to help these homeowners. We've ramped up this program. Even SIGTARP says in his report, it was ramped up extremely rapidly. And we've also had to put in proper controls to protect taxpayers, conduct outreach to millions of people. By the way, we reached out to 3.6 million people with inquiries asking them if they'd be interested in taking a modification. And uh, again, that's twice the number we el uh, estimate are eligible today. So we're trying to educate as many people as possible about this opportunity. And we're giving them a chance to get in. We've taken time because of the urgency of this program and because it was new and we were learning along the way to give people a chance to stay in while we would have time through the servicers to evaluate them. That period is rapidly drawing to a close. And we'll be able to move on, we, we believe now, with adequate capacity. We think this program is up to a level it can sustain itself and provide more rapid decisions to people who need them. Well, thank you very we much, Mr. Chairman. I think we all agree 6% is, is something that we should hope to improve that number to some degree. <laughs> no question about it. And I yield to the gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Ms. Allison, I have listened to you very, very carefully. And I want you to understand, um, this is not an attack on you or the department, but I got a feeling. I'm just, I've just listened to every syllable you've said, and I got a feeling that you've done enough. You've done a lot, but not enough. And just like in the shock trauma business, they say you have a golden hour, uh, a golden hour to keep somebody alive. I think we have a golden hour here to make a difference, and I really do thank our chairman for bringing us here today. And the reason why I say this, I know so much about this stuff because I deal with these people every day. I right. deal with them every day. Right. And there's some problems that still, even in what you have come up with, it's gonna, there's going to still be some problems. Let me give you an example. There's a prohibition against referral to foreclosure until either a borrower has been evaluated and determined to be ineligible for HAMP or reasonable solicitation efforts have, been, have failed. Right. The problem here is you're going to is, you know, what the, the, the process of evaluating. In the real life story, the person comes, they have the papers. I'm telling you, I've seen this happen many times. They, they, the papers are submitted, and they may, they may qualify, but they'll, maybe they don't. But, but the problem is a lot of times those papers are lost. Yeah. Are you following me? Yes. I've actually seen situations where my, my office has taken people's pay, papers and we fax them from my office to the, the servicer and they still got lost. Yeah. Right. So here I got somebody who is losing their home. And so I'm trying to figure out if they're losing, if they, if they're losing it from a, a congressman's office, then, you know, that's a, then, and, the, and the clock starts ticking at what point? And, you, and the reason why I'm going to that is because what we found is that a lot of people, and I, and I know one of the reasons why you have this new rule here, is because a lot of people were being foreclosed upon yes. in the process of just trying to get in the process. Yep. And that's a problem. 
And, and the reason why I talked about the golden hour is because I don't want us to be just repeating over and over again. And then when the chairman brings you back here in three or four months or whatever, and he asks the question, what pro kind of progress have we made? We got, he, and you, can, you, 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 come, you will come up with possibly with the same numbers. But the problem is the pain is still there. The people yes. have been thrown yeah. out of their houses. Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out what, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, Congressman, you make a great point, and we understand that issue. Now, let me tell you what we have done to help people like that. First of all, any person like the individual you mentioned can call 888-995-HOPE. That's our hotline that's been set up, manned every day to take people's concerns and help them deal with this process. So if they call us, we will contact the servicer. We'll find out what is going on and help that person. Secondly, they can go to our website, www.makinghomeaffordable.gov, and they can download forms. They can contact counselors through that website as well who can help them. Now, we, are you, do you have enough personnel? Because there was yes. testimony earlier that you didn't have enough personnel. We have personnel in the, in, the, uh, in the call center to handle those calls. We also monitor the volume of calls, the reasons for the calls, the number of complaints, the number of people who need their case escalated within the servicer, and we help them escalate the case to a higher person in management in the servicer well, so they can have their course, case dealt with. Of course, Mr. Chairman. You, you, yes. you know, what is the problem then? Because uh, th there is a problem. I'm sure you will acknowledge yeah. that. We acknowledge that. Absolutely, we do. It, but if you have enough employees, yeah. then I don't understand why this is not working. Yeah. You know, there are... This is a vast program. We're reaching out to millions of people. Um, there are cases, and fortunately, the complaints are declining these days. We monitor that very closely. We still get complaints. There still are problems. I fully agree with that. And so we also have audit processes through Freddie Mac. They're auditing whether people who are eligible for this program and in the servicers are getting modifications. What is the service quality? We're going to be reporting more and more publicly on the service quality of each servicer. And our reports now run 10 pages every month. People can look at a variety of information about service quality, the servicer's performance, et cetera. And we're adding to that. We're going to be uh, providing more information uh, in the coming months on the time it takes servicers to answer the calls, to measure uh, the, the, the quality of service, uh, the number of modifications that they're doing, and the auditors uh, look over the quality of those modifications. If people are being denied a modification unfairly, the auditors will find it. But in the first place, we want the individual to get in touch through the telephone number I gave or through our website or directly to their servicer and get help. We've set up mechanisms for them to get help. We, want, we don't want anybody to miss an opportunity to get one of these modifications. This has been, I think we have to understand, we have, we've been changing the entire servicing industry. This is all new to servicers. I'm not cutting them any slack, but they've had to get up, uh, get up to speed as well. They've had teething problems along the way. Uh, we have worked with them constantly to improve their service. So I think we are going to still see some complaints. That's why I'm making this appeal to people who may be watching this testimony to get in touch with us, 888-995-HOPE, and get help right now and get their questions answered. There's also a lot of misinformation about this program. And it's important that people understand how it works. And that's why we've uh, created this outreach program and the complaint system and the information on our website uh, so that people can find out the real facts about this program and how to get help. Mr. Chairman, may I? Just, may I Glad to yield you an additional minute. Thank you very much. The 80, you said there are 91,000 people who have, they've got letters in right. their hand and they haven't agreed to it. That's is right. that, is, is, perhaps, is that because they did not, uh, they have not gotten, I mean, the, 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 the loan, in other words, the rate may be higher than what it was before, in other words, their monthly payment? Oh, no. Uh, the people who get into a trial modification, Congressman, get a reduction immediately. Okay. And from day one, 
uh, as at w we, we believe that in the trial mods as well, approximately f around $500 a month of savings, okay? okay but, we, we, but we know for a fact in final mods, it's over $500 a month. Last question. The Bank of America yes. offer. Yeah. I am, I am asking you. It's, you think that's a good thing, right? The Bank I of do. America, where they're going to reduce principal. Is that I right? Do. Yes. I, I am asking you and Secretary Geithner to, 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 to try to get other banks to do the same thing. I Are you all planning to do that? I couldn't agree with you more. Because it's fact, so important. In fact, we've been in dialogues not just with Bank America going back some time about ideas just like this, but with others. Mm -hmm. And we're going to continue that. Now, let me make a couple of points. First of all, we applaud Bank America for rolling out that program that they announced yesterday. To put it in perspective, uh, that program uh, will help, as they announced, about 45,000 people, or about 5% of the homeowners who are behind in their payments by two months or more at Bank America alone. And a as, as, as happy as we are about that initiative, Bank America has uh, today uh, offered uh, modifications to about 24% of the people uh, who are eligible uh, who at least are 60 days plus delinquent at Bank America. Uh, they rank 14th out of the top 24 servicers. They have probably the largest book of, uh, of uh, loans in the country. We want them to do better. They're striving to do better. But they have a long way to go, as do others. We're not slacking off one bit with any of these banks. We're working closely with them. We appreciate their efforts, which have been huge, to transform their servicing business to meet this great challenge. But all of us know we have more to do. They have more to do. We appreciate the input from many of you on this panel and others in Congress. We have come up with, we think, some uh, interesting ideas, as I alluded to in my testimony, to enable some additional people to participate in this program uh, who may be unemployed or who need principal reduction. And we look forward to speaking with you very, very soon about these ideas and to moving forward with them. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen from Maryland, for his um, uh, gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you for being here, Mr. Allison. Uh, as you know, I come from Cleveland, Ohio, and coming from there, I saw the danger perhaps earlier than, than some. Um, that the housing financial crisis would pose for the nation because the foreclosure crisis's first victims were in places like Cleveland, Ohio. Right. And that was back in 2004 and 2005 when their entire neighborhoods were, were many of the homes in the neighborhoods have been foreclosed. There are blocks where most of the houses on a block were foreclosed in, in my district and even more so in the district of uh, my sister next door, Congresswoman Fudge. My domestic policy subcommittee took up the um, issue as soon as I received the gavel in 2007 and we focused on the foreclosures and we've been at it ever since. And I, I know, and everyone at this dais knows, it, that the administration inherited this mess. I know it because my domestic policy subcommittee and exposed, uh, investigated and exposed the Bush administration's Treasury Department apparent unwillingness, um, apparent to, to us anyway, to do foreclosure mitigation back in October 2008. We've held 10 hearings on the problem of foreclosure and solutions to it. 10 hearings. And with the new administration having taken office, we had uh, your chief of home preservation testify twice. We've had nation's experts testify, including, I might add, the Michigan law professor, who would later be named assistant secretary for financial institutions. My staff called various approaches to show uh, you how you could encourage principal reduction 
principal reduction on a large scale. And, and we sent up the Treasury the best concepts. Uh, my staff and I have met repeatedly with top people at Treasury and at HUD about the need for principal reductions. Now, we pushed, we prodded, and we pressed. Over three years after I've held my first hearing about foreclosure, we really haven't seen any bold new initiatives coming out of Treasury to address the, under, the, the underlying problem of underwater mortgages. Those, what are we doing to help those people yeah. who owe more on their homes than a home is worth? Now, in the meantime, we've heard from experts who've studied this crisis, and their empirical research shows that loan modifications, which include principal reduction, have the lowest re-default risk, especially in states, in states with the steepest price declines and the highest foreclosure rates. But now we've heard from Mr. Borofsky that HAMP, as it currently stands, may actually de-incentivize principal reduction. And every day the crisis continues, the tragedy of foreclosures continues as thousands of homeowners are receiving foreclosure notices and the delinquency rate is the highest ever recorded. Whole neighborhoods in Cleveland yeah. hollowed out by this foreclosure crisis. So time, time's running out to make any meaningful difference, uh, Mr. Allison. Half of the foreclosures are borrowers with negative equity in their homes. And I, I'm concerned about our government being responsive. We need to show Americans that government can work for them. We need to show Americans that government can help save their homes. D does the administration get that, Mr. Allison? Does the administration understand that a meaningful solution to the astronomical level of foreclosures is it would be an aggressive and, and broad principal reduction initiative? I, I, tell me, Mr. Allison, what else do we have to do to get Treasury to act? Mr. Allison. Yes, sir. Um, you touch on an extremely important issue, and that is the principal reduction question. Uh, let me uh, give you a, a couple of uh, responses to that. The first is that um, uh, for people who are uh, seriously underwater, usually a second lien accounts for about half of that amount. And we have been working since last summer to create a second lien program. And finally, we have uh, the top four banks who have joined that program. And those are uh, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and just yesterday, Citigroup. So we're pleased that finally the four banks that account for about half of the second liens in America have joined this program. So now we're in a position to start to move forward to address the second lien program, especially for those who qualify for the HAMP program. So we have what's called the uh, 2MP program, which is our second lien effort. And uh, we, ha we think that that can play a meaningful role in reducing principal for distressed homeowners. Now, within the HAMP program itself, since the beginning, the HAMP program has allowed principal forbearance, and about a quarter of the participants in HAMP are receiving principal forbearance. Very few, though, on your point, have received at actual principal reduction. For many months, we've been looking along with HUD and others uh, in the administration at the, at, the, uh, at the problem of underwater mortgages. Uh, this crisis has, uh, has, 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 has changed somewhat over the past year from what was primarily a subprime crisis at the beginning to what today is unemployment and uh, underwater mortgages have come to the fore as two of the major uh, issues. Uh, in this effort to examine the, uh, the principal reduction problem, uh, we've been mindful, first of all, of the uh, potential cost of such a program. Secondly, of the fairness of doing principal reduction for some people. Uh, and uh, thirdly, of the uh, moral hazard issue. And uh, getting back to the cost, uh, we estimate that uh, the amount of the underwater portions of mortgages in the United States is 500 to 700 billion dollars. That under those underwater mortgages are heavily concentrated in five states. California and Florida account for about half of all of the underwater mortgages uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and then uh, three other states account for about 25% more. So about three-fourths of the underwater uh, mortgages are in five states. 
Um, we are uh, 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 working to address that uh, through the, uh, the Help for the Hardest Hit Areas program, which was announced uh, some weeks ago. And that's underway. It's possible uh, we're looking at possibly expanding that program uh, because it has been extremely well received. Uh, that program should help to uh, address the underwater mortgage problem and the unemployment problem for those hard hit states. We also are going to learn from the innovative approaches that those states may take through their uh, housing finance agencies. And that may help better inform other states as well as ourselves. Uh, and lastly, we've been looking at ways of perhaps uh, modifying our own HAMP program so that we might be able to make uh, 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 this available to more people, some additional people whose mortgages are underwater or who are unemployed. And we want to be talking with you uh, about that uh, in uh, the next few days um, as we continue to try to improve our programs. If I may go on just for a second. Uh, I know that a question was raised about the number of changes we've made to HAMP uh, since it began. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, we've been, been learning as we went along. We want to continue to improve this program so we can meet that objective of helping three to four million people avoid foreclosure over the next uh, uh, three years to go. Uh, secondly, the servicers only had so much capacity to absorb change. We didn't want to slow them down by putting too much burden on them to, to make massive changes all at once. We think we have a much stronger program today, uh, and we're going to continue to strengthen it in ways that I just mentioned. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member of the committee, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, apologize for my absence, but I'll brief you later, and it was well worthwhile for the committee. Mr. Allison, uh, earlier uh, we heard basically about a program that is underachieving and delaying. Did you ever envision that that curve, a curve showing, if you will, justice has been so delayed and therefore denied, would exist when you began this program? Uh, I, I think it's fair to say, uh, uh, Mr. Issa, that when we started this program, uh, we did not fully envision the challenges that we would uh, encounter. First of all, in people being able to provide us with the documents that they need in order for us to give them a final modification. Uh, another was the amount I, of I'm going to stop you yes, to sir. follow up on that. Please go ahead. As I said in my opening statement and in the questions earlier, Today, I can go to any bank in America and I can make application for a pre-qualified pre loan and I can expect to have an answer in a matter of days or weeks at the most. Why in the world, when government gets in the middle of it, narrows the amount of people that you allow to do these loan modifications, can then that self-inflicted wound that they don't have time to quickly provide the same service that is routinely uh, filed, you know, processed, at the height was being processed in far more loans than you're ever dreaming of dealing with now. Well, uh, they had a business for many years of generating new loans. And, These uh, are new loans. Yes. Well, actually, what we're doing is what they've had to learn how to do is to uh, transform, tailor make modifications for individuals to suit certain standards of affordability and uh, also uh, to make sure that these are people who are owning their own home that's being modified. We're not helping uh, uh, investors who may have bought houses and expected to flip them. No, I appreciate and make the due diligence. So, but, but what what has had to happen, if I if I may, yeah, sure. is to for the servicers to generate the capacity to serve individuals one by one on a mass scale to modify their mortgages. And they were not equipped. As I mentioned earlier, servicers didn't provide service. They collected money every month, and they foreclosed on people who didn't pay. So well, they've had to engage now these that you're, people. Now that yes, you're where you are, yes. let's, let's talk about how we get from failure to success. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you allow a set of the newest criteria to be placed out there for any reputable, let's start with FDIC-approved banks, 
even if they use a servicer or somebody else, ultimately they put their name on it when they submit it. Why wouldn't you allow them to go through the process, not of getting someone into loan modification, but doing the entire paperwork to provide affidavit of ownership and residence, the, uh, the critical information about real ability to pay both their, uh, and I believe it should include their yeah. other debts, yeah. uh, and a, uh, an independent uh, appraisal of the home they want to keep, and have that package ultimately then, through whatever processor, come prepared. Why wouldn't we switch from a, a pre-process that, that gives hope and then dashes those hopes through delay? Why wouldn't we change this to a process that says, look, almost anybody in the loan business can put together these packages. They're not that exotic. Ultimately, the loan modification details, I appreciate that they are individual that you have to have a fairly skilled group that, right. that says, okay, now we're going to give you your package. Right. But most of that absence of anything has to do with simply people putting in, uh, if you will, a next generation of liar loans, which you allowed for a long time, you know, just tell me you have so much income, and then you change the rules, thankfully, thankfully to no, you have to actually show you have the income, because we don't want to waste time with people who will redefault, and so on. Why in the world wouldn't we get out of this prequal that leaves people in limbo, limbo uh, and get to the idea that 30 days from the time a package is submitted from anybody, if it's complete, people be, should be in the process of negotiating yeah. a final right. qualified. Mm -hmm. And those who aren't qualified get turned away after they pay a de minimis fee for qualification to, through a long list of qualified institutions so that these sham operations are excluded. Yeah. Well, actually, what we're doing by now uh, requiring uh, that the documents be provided uh, before the, mod the, the uh, trial modification is granted, I think that'll go a long way towards speeding this process up. Now, that begs again the question, well, why didn't you do that in the first place? And the reason was we had a huge backlog of people who were waiting for relief, and we felt it was more important to bring them into this program rapidly. It hasn't cost the taxpayers a dime if people drop out because their stated income doesn't match eventually the documents they provide. Only the people who get into the final modifications, and that's where the taxpayers' payments right, but, come but, in. You know, on our side of the aisle, a, uh, on our side of the aisle, it looks more like politics to put people in to make sure something was working when in fact you're hurting not helping those people on both sides of the aisle. We're concerned that at the end of, call it a year, very soon, that we're not, we don't have a million people, if there, if there are a million people, qualified and delivered. And if the chairman will indulge me for just a moment, I am probably one of the strongest advocates of keeping the moral hazard there. But I will tell you, as you look at the other uh, programs that you're looking at, if somebody has a building, a home, that they purchased for $400,000, it's now worth $250,000, and the bank will sell it for no more than $250,000, if the existing person who has a no recourse loan, as they do in California, Florida, and most states, can walk away and the bank has 250000 that is not a cram down. That is a competitive process in which the home, if the homeowner is qualified and able to be the high bidder, if you will, or an acceptable bidder, even if it's a, a straw man type bidding, there's not a moral hazard. That's why Bank of America has made a decision to, to reach out to 49,000 people that I, they believe qualify for that and abate some of the principal over time because ultimately they don't want to take back a house and sell it, get no more money, and go through all the other costs. That's good business. And I, and I hope that on both sides of the aisle we're sending you a clear message that moral hazard is you're subsidizing continued bad behavior or extending people uh, the ability to stay in a home that they should make plans to get out of. If a bank would get let no more money, then getting to that point so the bank is made whole, you folks at Treasury can be confident that banks are writing to their correct value. All of that is what both sides of the aisle thought TARP was going to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah. May I respond, uh, well, sure. sorry, uh, Representative Issa? Uh, first of all, there's nothing that prevents a bank right now from writing down the value of that mortgage that's on its books and helping that person stay in their home. Because in most cases, as we're finding, there's a higher present value to keeping that person in the home than foreclosing, which is painful for everybody, not just the homeowner, but the bank. 
but they, in some cases, have been slow to do that. Uh, I applaud what Bank of America is doing. It's time for other banks to recognize reality and help people writing down second liens as well as first liens, right? So we're very mindful in our programs of not engendering moral hazard and causing people to default on purpose in order to get their principal reduced if they can afford to pay. So we are looking at ways of, of balancing concerns about uh, uh, taxpayer funds being used uh, as part of a, uh, a principal reduction effort, uh, the moral hazard of, of strategic default, the fairness of one person who may have put down 30 percent for a mortgage and the next door person put down zero and took a, a, a second lien, and uh, making sure that we're being fair to everyone as possible, while still trying to promote financial stability and keep neighborhoods whole. Uh, back to your you know, question about uh, the, 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 the time that this is taken and your chart across here. This uh, excuse was, me, that's yes, the GAO's sir. chart. We, we yes, didn't, it's fine. not neither yeah, of us. GAO's it. chart. And uh, w it, it does show that it's taken a while to get the final mod program up and running. People were in the trial modifications. We extended that period for, uh, for, for a while to give more people a chance to qualify. But now it's picking up very rapidly. We have about a third of the people who are eligible for a final mod today, they've completed the three months, already have one or one is on their desk to be signed. We're rapidly catching up in, in that area. I think you're going to see final mods uh, uh, rising quite rapidly over the next few months as the backlog is cleared and people know where they stand. And I'm very hopeful that many of the people awaiting a decision are going to get a final mod. I and the gentleman's so. time Thank has expired. Chairman. I really hope that by the next time we have a hearing uh, that uh, the results will really be different. I'm yes. hoping that the program works yeah. because uh, right. a lot of people out there in pain, have, I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're just really uh, losing their homes and the, the pain and the suffering around it is something that we really have to do something about. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu. Secretary uh, Allison, I raised this uh, issue of, of uh, my constituent earlier, but I want to hear what you have to say. This, is, um, this comes from this uh, long letter that a constituent wrote to me, and, and I met with her, and she was in tears. Uh, she and her parents are on the brink of losing their home to an auction in less than one week, uh, and they've been in that home since 1993. Uh, they applied to the HAMP trial period plan for three months with J.P. Morgan Chase, and faithfully play, uh, paid their, their, uh, the, the amounts that were required. They submitted their payments, in fact, timely. Um, as they went through this process, they hardly received any information or status updates on their modification applications, verbally or in writing. Uh, about five months later, uh, her parents finally received a letter from Chase indicating that they'd been denied and that their house was going to be auctioned off in 30 days even though they had successfully made these five trial period payments. Um, so I, I find this horrifying. Um, the, the Cardiel family had to jump through their hoops uh, for five months and they played by the rules only to end up being told that, they're, they're, uh, that uh, they were losing their homes and that they had to get out within days of notification. Uh, and I felt that they were really um, strung along here. Uh, so I, w the way I see it is, th first of all, there's the lack of responsiveness and timely updates from the loan servicers. We even hear other horrifying stories about lost paperwork. Secondly, th there is no appeals process in place uh, whatsoever. Thirdly, there isn't a sufficient notification process uh, before people are being notified that they're being kicked out of their homes. So what is the Treasury doing about these three issues? When can we ex expect that a fair and just appeals process will be put in place so that homeowners can, can at least find out what, what the uh, question was and yeah. uh, see whether it was justified? Okay. And shouldn't families be given more notice and time to prepare and find alternate, alternative housing uh, in a case such as this family's case where their home is being put on auction immediately? Uh, thank you very much for your question. First of all, we'll be glad to look at that particular case for you and contact uh, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase about it, but more broadly, because other people may have the same situation. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, we've uh, issued a new supplemental directive, which provides that uh, uh, 
people cannot be put in foreclosure while their uh, decision, while the decision on a modification is being made. Uh, we already have requirements that the homeowner is entitled to understand the reasons for a denial, and they can phone in and appeal a denial. Uh, we have a phone number, again, it's 888-995-HOPE, uh, that the homeowners can call to see if they have a, an issue with their servicer, they can escalate that through our call center to more senior people in the servicer to deal with it. We also have an auditing function which will go and check on the performance of servicers in making sure that people who qualify for this program are getting a mod. And uh, therefore, I think there are a number of ways that uh, the person you mentioned could get help, but I want to accelerate that on her behalf. So if you can give me the information after the hearing, I'll be glad to find out what is happening with that particular case. Are you saying that the appeals process is in place right now? We have an escalation process and have for some time. I, and I, th I think we have to do more to get the word out, frankly. Uh, and that is, that all they have to do is telephone that phone number, or they can get on makinghomeaffordable.gov. They can get in touch with counselors. They can get in touch with their servicer. They can also get uh, documents. If they're having trouble with the servicer not handling the documents or they don't know what right the documents are, they can get the documents on our website. So there are a lot of ways people can get help. And I think people are still uh, uh, struggling with getting the right information about this program. We have many outreach events. We've had over 20 events last year around the country, and especially in hard hit areas, to bring in individuals along with the servicers, have them get together and directly try to work out a modification of a loan. We're conducting more of those events around the country this year as well. So we're trying, and we're also going to have a public service campaign. It's already underway. Uh, and uh, we're going through thousands of media outlets to try to communicate even more uh, how the program works and how to get help. You said that there should not be a foreclosure during the during, trial process, yes. but yeah. in this case, she, she yeah. had no input and then uh, finally was denied and now is immediately being foreclosed upon. Yeah. Well, uh, she should also be offered, uh, first of all, a chance to understand what happened. And that's where I think we have to get involved in that particular case. Okay? And uh, there are going to be people who don't qualify for a final modification for one reason or another. And uh, uh, in that case, we also have programs to avoid foreclosure, such as a short sale or a deed in lieu. And we provide allowances for people if they need to relocate. So uh, if they have to leave their home, they can do so in dignity. But first of all, we want to try to prevent as many foreclosures or people le having to leave their home as possible. And that's why I think it's important to get the word out early so people understand the process. And uh, if indeed they're not going to qualify for a mod, they've had time to, to uh, uh, look at alternate solutions. My time is up, but I'll, I'll, I would just say that yeah. They, I just don't want them to ha be given false hope if they yes, actually don't qualify. I, I completely agree. Right. And so, uh, and we, we will certainly uh, uh, work on your suggestion as well and see how we can make this program better in that regard. Thank you. Gentlewoman's time has expired. Gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I don't know, were you in when the uh, first panel was, was engaged in discussion? Yes, I was first of all listening to it and then I was here at the latter part mm -hmm. of it, yes. The whole question of, of disparities have crept into the program right. and into the conversation right. and uh, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition have done a study and their survey show that uh, 57% of African Americans who were eligible for the HAMP program were denied. 41% of whites who were eligible were denied. Um, I'm sure that Treasury is aware of that. And, and what are you doing or, or, or what, what do you perceive there to be that can try and help rectify this disparity? Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. And we are very concerned that uh, 
no one be uh, denied access to these modifications uh, because of race or gender. And uh, so therefore, we've been requiring the servicers to follow the fair housing laws as they consider modifications and, uh, and, the, uh, and the fair lending uh, requirements. And also, uh, we've been collecting information uh, around uh, race and gender and ethnicity. And we're going to be uh, having that data available for publication in June. As soon as we have enough statistically valid data, we're going to be publishing it like we publish many other aspects of this program. And by the way, uh, uh, we do publish a report every month. And we've been expanding the amount of data. And also, people can access that information on our web website, makinghomeaffordable.gov. I think that this is an area we're very concerned about. That's why we're gathering the data. And if we find any type of discrimination, we're going to take action. We'll also have our auditors who will be looking at this. Uh, that, that's an aspect of the program as well. On an individual base, um, is there any kind of resource uh, uh, that, uh, I guess, individuals who feel that somehow or another they were treated unfairly? Yeah that they can make use of to try and rectify or to express uh, yes. their feelings and, and get some yes. action. Yeah. And they can, uh, for instance, uh, again, they can call our hotline and uh, 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 make an inquiry that way, and we will take it up. They can get in touch with us through our website, again, makinghomeaffordable.gov. They can. Uh, then contact through that website local counselors who may be able to help them as well. So there are many ways to get help. I think we have to get the word out. And uh, it's important that people understand that they don't have to go through this process alone. Would the gentleman yield just for 30 yes. seconds? Uh, you know, you mentioned that you would take action. And what kind of action? Well, when we find that, for instance, a servicer has been violating the rules of this program, and we can do that through audits that are conducted by Freddie Mac. And at the beginning, we set up an audit process for this program uh, because we have to make sure that these rules are being followed. So if they discover that uh, there are violations of our policies and procedures, we confront the servicer with that, and we work with them to make corrections. And if it's found that, for instance, people did not get a modification who deserved one under our rules, we go back and rectify that. Now, individuals who, and, and of course we know that many people are absolutely hard pressed in terms of being unemployed, um, don't have much equity in properties, and from a, a banking transaction or lending transaction, mortgage transaction, doesn't look like they can really make it. Are there any other activities that, that might be able to help these individuals to remain in their homes? Yeah. Well, uh, for example, there's the uh, Neighborhood Stabilization Program, which uh, is, I think, uh, a powerful force in many uh, communities around the country, especially low-income communities. We have the housing finance agencies. We're providing more support for them as well. And uh, our, uh, our program for the hardest hit areas, I think, will be uh, very helpful in creating innovative ways, especially to uh, provide assistance to people who are unemployed, who are maybe deeply underwater, or who are low income. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I now yield to the gentleman from Missouri, Congressman Clay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Allison. Uh, like my, my friend from Illinois, I too uh, found it very, extremely disturbing to hear uh, about the racial disparities that Mr. Taylor testified to on the previous panel. Uh, and along the same lines of uh, Mr. Davis's questioning, um, what can the department do to try to address the concerns raised by Mr. Taylor and, and the members of this committee on um, the, I guess, the whole racial insensitivity of the mortgage industry, 
of the plight of the people who are now underwater in the process of foreclosure, what programs can the Treasury put in place as, as our government to help uh, repair the damage, to help repair um, this, this, this want on onward aggression that was displayed towards a class of people? What can happen? Well, as you point out, uh, there was uh, uh, widespread predatory lending practices during the uh, mid part of this decade, and they caused tremendous damage around the country. Uh, one reason why the Secretary of the Treasury has been pressing so hard, and the President, for financial reform is to be able to establish a stronger consumer protection agency to help prevent abuses like this from recurring again. Now, the damage already exists, and we want to make sure that in our program there's not ongoing discrimination as people are considered for modifications. And that's why we're collecting that information. We look forward to uh, publishing the first data around uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, distribution of uh, modifications by race, ethnicity, and so forth and gender. And uh, with that, I think we'll have a tool to confront servicers in mortgage, in mortgage modification practices if indeed they're showing discrimination. And it's going to take some aggressive uh, actions on the part of the Treasury uh, to, to really crack down on these abuses and to discourage, to discourage it and eliminate it from the marketplace. Now, let me, let me move on to HAP. To my understanding, HAP was modeled after the FDIC's uh, IndyMac program, which only had a borrower response rate of 50 percent during its most successful run. Um, let me ask you, why did you choose to model HAP after a program that was only moderately successful? Well, actually, uh, we think HAMP is quite an innovative program. It's the first large program of its type that has required uh, substantial reductions in people's monthly mortgage payments. And as you look back at other uh, modification programs in the past, many of which were abject failures, had either they uh, modified very few loans or there was a very large redefault rate. It's because in almost all those cases, they didn't meaningfully reduce people's monthly payments. So there's really not much data to go on with this program other than what we see so far, and I think it's still too early to make final judgments, but uh, during the, the trial modification process, uh, the rate of uh, uh, people dropping out of the program uh, has been lower, somewhat lower than we would have expected. Uh, the rate of people who are unable to make the payments is somewhat lower than we expected. Um, and uh, again, we're making further improvements in this program with a view toward assuring that it's affordable and bringing in more people who can get help. Any, any uh, idea of how many people have, have opted to remain in the home and, and rent from the new owner? Or has that developed yet? Or are we far enough down the path to see those yeah. trends? Uh, I really don't have that information, uh, but I'll be happy to try to get it for you. you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I I'll certainly will. Back. Thank you, gentlemen from Missouri, for yielding. Let me just say that, you know, um, and I'm happy that you were able to hear the testimony earlier today. Uh, the one thing that really still sort of stands out and sticks with me is the inconsistency of the servers. You know, this was a point that was made uh, today. Right. You know, uh, what can Treasury do about these kind of things, you know, um, um, from an enforcement standpoint? Yeah. Well, again, we You, you know, are, if you have a servicer yes. that, you know, and I'm actually responding to this whole thing in terms of the disparities, you know, if you have a servicer uh, that um, for some reason is not performing or uh, for some reason feels that um, um, they don't have to process uh, well, what happens, you know, because I'm sure there must be a way that you could look at how many people they've actually uh, processed. Oh, yes. Uh, 
In fact, we publish that data every month. And uh, uh, what we are showing is the, uh, in addition to uh, simply how many 60-day-plus uh, delinquent loans each servicer has, how many trial modifications have been made, how many final modifications. We're going to have much more information about the quality of their service. But most importantly, I think from the standpoint of the question you're asking, we have an audit capability. We can look at their actual performance, and we then engage them uh, on ways that they can improve. And by also publishing the information, we're shining the public light on them. And that's a powerful incentive for them to improve their performance. I would say that uh, where we have uh, engaged servicers, where we're finding discrepancies between uh, their operations and what we think the proper standards ought to be, uh, they've been making improvements. And we have to continue uh, working closely with them until we reach a standard that we think is uniform and satisfactory. We still have a lot of work to do, I must say. But I think we also have to keep in mind this is a relatively new program. It was announced just over a year ago. It didn't really get running until last May. And uh, in less than a year, uh, we've seen over a million homeowners get real relief, which is continuing today. Uh, again, we have a lot more work to do to reach that three to four million target over the next several years. But I think we have, the servicers have much more capacity today. I think they're functioning better. Fortunately, the rate of complaints has been reduced, but it's still too high from our standpoint. So we want this program to continue maturing as rapidly as possible to provide the kind of service that we ought to expect from them. Right. Let me say that, you know, I had to reorganize my office to be able to try to help people through this process, you know, because there's sections in my area that where people are just losing their homes in tremendous numbers. Right. You know, um, are you doing anything to sort of advertise the fact that these services are going on, these programs are in existence? I mean, what is Treasury doing to advertise, yeah. just to, to get yes. the word out, yeah. you know, uh, that this is going on, you know, um, uh, and yeah. what you, you can do? And, I mean, have you spending any time doing any advertising? Yes, we are, Mr. Chairman. In fact, you, know, you touch on a very important point. Outreach all along has been extremely important to acquaint people with the existence of this program and then how to navigate through it uh, to, to get a modification. And uh, we have been conducting, as I mentioned before, uh, events around the country, especially in cities, major cities, where there are a lot of people who need relief, in order to acquaint them with the, uh, with the program, how it works, and to put them in direct touch at these events with the servicers who can help them. Uh, secondly, we're launching uh, already a public uh, service campaign, which is going to be uh, 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 more active in the coming weeks and uh, run through thousands of outlets around the country to make sure people are saturated with information, if we can, about this program. Right. Let me say this, and then I'm going to yield to a gentleman from, from Maryland. You know, um, I had an opportunity to look at the Urban League, the program, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, and their success. And, you know, and I'm saying that maybe that might be a, another thing you want to consider, is to let them expand their program because for some reason or another, they were able to sort of uh, uh, get people processed, get answers. Mm -hmm. And I don't know in terms of you know, uh, uh, how or why their situation is so different, but their success is amazing when you compare it with what else is going on. So uh, you might yeah. want to consider yeah. you know, uh, looking at, at what they're doing or expanding what they're doing. Yeah. Because uh, I think that, uh, um, if we're talking about keeping people in their homes, I think we need to have a program that's successful. Yeah, but we applaud what the Urban League is doing, and many other, by the way, community groups and counseling groups around the country, which we've linked up with. But let me go back, and uh, we will engage the Urban League and uh, see whether we can learn more. Thank you. Thank you. I yield to the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief, and I thank you. Just two things going to what you just talked about, Mr. Chairman. I think. The reason why the Urban League is, is so good is because it's intense. And they actually do the, they actually get to the servicers, which is very significant. And, and I just want, I have two concerns. One, because there are a lot of people, before we see you again, a lot of people may be losing their homes. And I want to make sure we're real clear. How do we, once a person gets in the process, um, how do we make sure, I mean, say, say like somebody from Mr. Towns' district comes in, 
they, they okay, they finally get a hold of the servicer. They're working out the deal. They're working out stuff. They, mm -hmm. you know, they're submitting their papers, and then the servicer is taking too much time, and the next thing you know, they face foreclosure. And as you know, when they face foreclosure, they it's like a it's like quicksand, because what happens is all those legal fees start coming in, and the next thing you know, they find, how do we they they don't have a house. It's sort of like death. You don't, it's, it's done, over. So the question is, how do we, how do you enforce making sure that people are not foreclosed upon? Let's say even if, you know, even if they're going through the process, how do you make sure that that does not happen? In other words, you, are you following my question? Yes, sir. Okay. I am. Go ahead. Well, I think And who very, does the enforcing? You very powerfully just explain the reason why we've issued this supplemental directive I described before, so that uh, servicers are not allowed to foreclose on people while they're still under consideration for a modification, and then not for some time afterwards. If it's so, that, so that everybody is watching this, does that mean that when that person submits a starts a process, gets in his paperwork, and starts a process, is, when does that? When does when does a stop sign up that you cannot foreclose upon this person? Because I'm worried that yeah. the servicers are not going to, and, and the chairman alluded to some of this. Is, uh, if let's say that their services are not co cooperating, you know, right. next thing you know, our constituent is right. out of a house. Right. Once they've submitted verifiable information as required by the program to the servicer, under this directive, they cannot be foreclosed on until after a decision about the mod has been made. Now, one thing that's important is a lot of people, when they receive a referral notice, they get very frightened, and they think, I'm going to get foreclosed on. Some people might even give up on a modification and start making plans to, to move out. We want to make sure that they're informed, and this is a massive outreach we have to make. It's not just enough to issue a, a, a directive right. to these servicers. We've got to get the word out. And, you know, uh, I think members of Congress and their staffs can help, as well as counseling groups. We have that public uh, 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 service campaign going. We have all these events. We have our website. We got our phone. And we want the word to get out that y you don't have to be, you, it, this is a natural process. That's what these servicers do. They'll start a foreclosure uh, process while they're considering people for mods. We have to make sure people understand you're not going to be foreclosed upon until after a decision is made, as long as you've given us verifiable documentation. Okay. And last but not least, Mr. Chairman, I, I would ask that if, if, if we could get copies of these audits conducted by Freddie Mac or Treasury for compliance, because that's an that, that's area that it sounds like, I mean, getting to some of the things that you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, that might help us to try to protect our constituents. But without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Let me say that, it, first of all, Mr. Allison, I appreciate you coming and listening to uh, the other witnesses because I think it's just so important for you to hear, you know, from them. And um, that is the reason why I rearranged it. I really wanted them to go first and let you hear from them because ordinarily I would have put you first. And, uh, but this is a very serious issue, and I really want to try to do whatever we can uh, to be able to keep people in their homes. And I want to be able, when uh, people are able to ask me, I want to be able to say I did everything I could to try to be helpful during this very difficult time and recognizing the fact that it is difficult. You know, and I listen to people all the time. You know, a lady on the phone two days ago who had two jobs, and of course the company moved. And of course, you know, now she has having difficulty paying her mortgage and she's trying to get a modification. I mean, I, it just goes on and on and on in terms of situations that people now find themselves in. You know, but I am uh, reminded today, though, how effective it can be to have a hearing. Uh, within the last 24 hours, you know, the department issued a new directive that, as I understand it, would prohibit foreclosure on all HAMP eligible loans until the borrower has had a chance to apply help from the 
making home affordable program. I think that is just remarkable, and I, want, I, I applaud you for that. And that's the kind of thinking I think that has to go into making certain that people are able to sort of stay in their homes. I know some will not be able to, but I think that we can do a whole lot better than what we're doing. And this should help with one of the biggest complaints borrowers have, that they have been unable to contact their lenders that their paperwork is lost over and over again and that I can't get anybody on the phone and nobody will talk to me and that they have not been given the opportunity to otherwise participate in HAMP. Also, over the last 24 hours, the biggest mortgage lender in the country, Bank of America, announced that it was adopting a mortgage reduction program for severely underwater homeowners. I think that's remarkable. And under this, under which a significant part of the principal will be forgiven. I hope that in your position that you can encourage other banks to take a very serious look at this. And I think this would help a lot of people. And uh, maybe the Bank of America can lead the way and others will be able to join in it. And reducing the amount owed on a mortgage strikes me as a very effective way to preserve home ownership while giving homeowners a realistic way to get their heads above the water again. Again, I strongly urge the Treasury Department to give serious consideration to a similar improvement to the HAMP program. But it should not stop there. I'm asking the Treasury Department to expand that idea to include more borrowers and more lenders. The time to stem the home foreclosure crisis is now. Uh, and I think that being creative, I really do believe that we can do a whole lot better than what we're doing in being able to keep people in their homes. Uh, this is a very sad and serious situation. When you have young children, you know, um, concerned about the fact they have to move out of their home, they have to move out, they move to another neighborhood, go to another school, only because the mother and father are having difficulty paying the mortgage. And in many instances, they've been in the house for several years. To me, I think there must be a way that we can deal with it. So I want to thank you, Mr. Ellison, for coming and staying the entire time. And of course, um, on this note, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Reserving the right to object, the record shall be left open for seven days so that members may submit information for the record.